the cards never lie. One of many emblematic catchphrases used by psychic tarot reader Miss Cleo, most recognized for her mid to late 90s animated late night TV infomercials, channel surfing would go from a mundane pastime in between commercials to an exhilarated comical show all on its own whenever that turban, 1-800 number, and questionable accent would satirically grace our television screens. Parodied by many, duplicated by none, Miss Cleo's controversial predictions allowed those dialing in to rest in her assured foresight, seeking refuge in her incorrect patois. Little did they know they were being scammed out of millions by the shaman herself, but perhaps Miss Cleo's vibrant personality was nothing more than a distraction to protect the puppeteers behind the scene. Several investigations, lawsuits, and aliases later would find her guilty not of any illegal wrongdoings, shockingly enough, but of deception about her character. The character we refer to as Miss Cleo. As tickling as that episode of That's So Raven parodying Miss Cleo was, the unraveling of the TV psychic was far from a laughing matter. From Raven, Comedy Central's Mad TV, to skits on The Dave Chappelle Show, Miss Cleo surely made her way around 2000s television, whether it be in the form of poking fun at the boisterous persona or hopping from talk show to talk show, taking her best shot at giving reciting audience members advice on whichever issues they were in need of resolving. From nonsensical baby mama drama to more philosophical woes, Miss Cleo's intuitive intellect was here to save the day and in more serious circumstances, possibly one's life. But before she was encouraging viewers to call her now, she was calling the shots way before her role as a mysterious Jamaican fortune teller. The role of director and writer of multiple plays filling up space in her life had been prioritized long before her days as Miss Cleo the TV psychic. Before Miss Cleo the on-screen Jamaican shaman, there was Miss Cleo the off-screen Jamaican shaman. Before either, there was a woman named Ray Paris. Neither were real names. Spoiler alert, none were actually Jamaican, and all were extracted figments of Cleo's imagination manifested into reality. <sighs> Let me explain. Inhabiting Seattle, Washington, the Langston Hughes Theater served to be ground zero for an incoming playwright's many productions. Going by the name Ray Paris, her presence alone, although not necessarily intimidating, yet dominating, could garner the attention of anyone in her presence. A knack for creativity and performing, Ray Paris set out to bring her once documented scripts to life. One of those being the infamous Four Women Only, where she plays a, wait for it, a Jamaican woman named Cleo who sold trinkets at a market. Infamous not because of the play itself, but more so how she handled the entire thing. Operating from a budget the Langston Cultural Arts Nonprofit Advisory Council gave her to pay cast and crew, when everything was all said and done, absolutely no one who'd partake in the production got their rightfully earned coin. Even a penny was apparently too much for Miss Cleo or Ray Paris to afford to give to the people who spent hours upon weeks and even months helping to animate her written story. Some of the teen ushers were, however, given $200 checks that ended up bouncing when they went to cash them in. Needless to say, Langston Hughes was not here for the thievery and put together a lawsuit they intended to hit Ray with. Miss Paris was one step ahead of them and ended up serving them letters, pleading for mercy, revealing that she'd been diagnosed with bone cancer to some, whilst telling others she had been diagnosed with sickle cell anemia and spent all of the play money on medical expenses. Ray Paris vanished from Langston Hughes like a thief in the night, never to be seen again. The lawsuit ultimately had no choice but to be dropped faster than the speed of lightning. Ray Paris was gone. Not a trace nor a note left behind. Nothing. Not even her real name could be souvenired or used as memorabilia for the students and performers who'd grown accustomed to the mystery woman. Almost like she never existed. One day she was here and the next day she was not. Out with her old role under the guise as a mystique, scriptwriter and into her next calling, quite literally. A call center job she'd get introduced to by her sister-in-law, but not just any old boring phone operation sting. A psychic hotline. Surely not just anybody can get a job predicting strangers' futures over the phone, can they? Unfortunately, yes. However, Miss Cleo was a little more than just some random they'd chosen off the street. 
According to Cleo herself, she wasn't new to this, but true to this. Before she was the Miss Cleo we have all come to recognize, she was behind the scenes reading pre-written scripts thrown together by producers. One day whilst on the job, the company hired a woman to be their new spokesperson, but let her tell it, the woman was not it. Atrocious even. Her vague predictions and inaccurate readings weren't sitting well with those dialing in nor the producers themselves. They had to come up with something and quick. Convincing the producer she'd do a better job than the last girl, Cleo quickly turned on her desk camera and began to do what she did best. Those scripts and protocols were quickly thrown out the window. The company loved what they were witnessing and soon enough Cleo would be revived as Miss Cleo, a Jamaican psychic spokesperson for the Psychic Readers Network. Miss Cleo claimed to have been from a long line of Jamaican shamans, which added to her mystique. The company absolutely loved what they were witnessing and so did viewers at home, who often called in solely to speak to Miss Cleo herself. Some in need of spiritual guidance, others just wanted bragging rights so they could tell their peers they'd spoken to the one and only Miss Cleo. Giving every ounce of fresh off the island appeal, her thick accent, off the dome accurate readings, and personable persona made Miss Cleo a knockout. And before her and the company knew it, Miss Cleo was an overnight sensation. Calls began ringing off the hook, deals started pouring in, and it appeared as though Miss Cleo was basking in all of her newfound fame. The network was raking in the calls, but unfortunately for those blowing up their hotline bling, they'd be raking up those collections, letters, bills upon bills and fees of every minute they'd unwittingly spent on the phone chatting to their chosen spiritual advisor. Despite her famous call me now catchphrase insinuating those eager to do so would get the chance to speak to her and her only, those seeking Miss Cleo specifically were often redirected to other psychics who were instructed to get the caller's name and address. Their goal? To keep them on the phone for as long as possible. If you wanted to speak to Miss Cleo personally, operators would place you on hold as they wandered around in search of the head medium. Or at least, this is what the person on the other end was led to believe. Oftentimes than not, the other operators were fully aware that the callers were not going to be given the chance to speak to their favorite psychic, but had to make them believe they'd be given the chance. In actuality, actually speaking to Miss Cleo directly was often rare. You're probably wondering what it takes to be hired as a psychic telephone operator or where on earth one finds a bunch of qualified psychics willing to aid others in their journeys on this here planet. And the answer is absolutely nothing and absolutely anywhere. All you need is a name and barely that. As long as you could read, barely, you were in there. For the most part, it seemed that so callers could care less if the person they were speaking to was actually able to predict the future or not. They just wanted someone to talk to. It's without question that those lost souls looking for direction over at the Psychic Readers Network were often taken advantage of, all fingers being pointed at Miss Cleo. But we'd soon find out that the clairvoyant was nothing more than a checkers piece being utilized in a lengthy game of chess. She rose to the top of the pop culture ladder. Little did she know investigators were hot on the PRN, Psychic Readers Network trail, racking up enough evidence to turn their findings into lawsuits. The first batch of investigations came at the latter years of the 20th century, and that three-worded disclaimer displayed at the bottom of every Miss Cleo-related infomercial, insisting that her services were for entertainment only, wasn't stopping whatever the feds had up their sleeves. In 1999, the Court TV network, now known as True TV, opened up an investigation with the hopes of determining whether or not Mrs. The Cards Don't Lie was who she claimed to be. When everything was said and done, investigators found that many of those so-called psychics were actually just voice actors reading from a script. A former employee confirmed this in 2012 and gave exclusive details about her time as a faux fortune teller Ellen confessing she found out about the position in a classified ad in the local paper. It paid $12 an hour. The investigations didn't stop there. In 2001, the state of Missouri sued the hotline for fraud with a bunch of other states following suit. Who would have thought, call me now for your free tarot reading, came with a price, a hefty one. Despite being advertised as free, what she forgot to tell you was that it was free. For the first 59 seconds or so, after being hit with collection letters and harassed via the same telephones they used to seek help on, 
Those that fell victim to the hotline hustle were left perplexed when they realized they had an excessive charge of what was supposed to have been a free service. Children up after hours toying around with their house phones would also play with the 1-800 number long after their parents went to sleep, only to be awakened by the daunting realization that their phone bills had cultivated more numbers than an addict playing the lottery. Everything came to a head in 2002 after countless investigations led to the Federal Trade Commission filing a complaint against the Psychic Readers Network. Enough was enough and they were on a mission to take down Miss Cleo and her exaggerated patois. The man that led the rebellion, Attorney General Dave Ehrenberg, a lawyer within the Florida Attorney General's office, had actually been the first to list Cleo herself in the lawsuit versus others who attempted to file suits against PRN in the past. After all, Miss Cleo was solely the face of the network, an image, a spokesperson. Think Flo from Progressive or even Jake from State Farm. None of that mattered because two major corporations, Psychic Readers Network and Access Resource Services, as well as Miss Cleo, were all being sued by the state of Florida for deceptive advertising, billing, and collection practices, and a whole list of claims longer than the Declaration of Independence. Many of those that testified against the companies were people who'd once been employed by them and best believe they left no stone unturned. It'd be revealed that the company had been built on an inauthentic foundation. All hell's breaking loose, but Miss Cleo didn't allow the case to dim her light, often showing up to the courthouse all 32 teeths on full display. With the case making national headlines, she go from hero to villain real quick, using her powers to scam the public instead of aiding their vulnerabilities. It was giving very much sham and not enough shaman. Those over at PRN were making a mere 24 million in less than two years, compared to Miss Cleo's 450,000 she'd make in the same time frame. But not so fast, because Cleo insisted that I too am a victim. In fact, the very first infomercial she did for the company made millions. Cleo, on the other hand, only received $17.50 for her efforts. Fighting for her innocence and later her redemption, her main argument in all of this was her lack of power over her image. She had no control over what was used or how it was utilized. They had complete exclusivity of my name. I argued with them constantly. In the midst of all the chaos, the Attorney General's office decided to apply even more pressure. Obtaining as much info as they could, we'd be bombarded with a document that'd be a staple for their defense and a threat to Cleo's true identity, her birth certificate. Real name, Ure Dale Harris. We'd soon discover that Miss Cleo wasn't born in Jamaica at all, contrary to her official website specifically stating she was born and raised in Trelawney. Her parents were also said to have been Jamaican, but we'd find out that too was a lie. Her birth records indicate that she'd come from immigrant Caribbean parents, but they too were also confirmed to be American. In fact, Uray had been born and raised right here in the States, Los Angeles to be exact. The deeper they went, the more names they seemed to discover. Ray Paris, Cleo Millie Harris, Uray Paris, Cleo Millie Paris, the list goes on and on. So what is the truth? Who exactly is Miss Cleo? Here it is, the answer you've all been waiting for. Call her Miss Multiple Personalities. Uray's upbringing was nowhere near ideal. When she was just an infant, her biological mother traveled from the Caribbean to Los Angeles and handed her over to a Jamaican couple who'd end up raising her along with eight to nine other children. An all-girls Catholic boarding school would be her obligatory source of education as well as a solace distraction from the evil doings that often take place within her home away from home. She was an intelligent child, a little too intelligent for comfort to the average person, a semi-heavy set teen who snapped photos for her school's yearbook that her peers and those around long enough to experience her entirety described as an all-American valley girl. She was college educated, enrolled at the University of Southern California, and oddly enough, no one can recall an accent of any sort seeping through her lips, something we'd be reminded yet again by staff and crew years down the road who'd worked alongside her at the Langston Hughes Theater. But perhaps her love for creating characters was birthed out of scent? Before Cleo reached a solid decade on Earth, she'd already been meditating on the idea of taking her own life. 
Escaping the turmoil within her own little body by any means was something she'd been fixated on since before she reached prepubescent status. Once nightfall casted over the West Coast, a routine of shying away in corners anxiously awaiting the repetitive sexual violation by a male family member was something she'd gotten accustomed to. With no safe place, safety net, or adult to confide in, Cleo escaped to the one place she felt the safest, her mind. She'd go on to marry a man, bear a child, and divorce all before the age of 21. Her then ex-husband contracted AIDS and unfortunately passed away from the virus not too long after. Did we mention her ex-husband was gay? Not only was he team LGBT, but so was she. Coming into her sexuality at just 16, Cleo knew she liked the girls early on. However, her partner's relatives weren't having any of that. Cleo's GF had a beard so that her family would be suspicious of her attraction towards women. Cleo then used the same tactic when she married her husband. Since then, she's been in two long-term relationships, both two women, and welcomed a second daughter in her late 20s. After months of investigation, the FTC officially charged those behind Access Resource Services, Inc. and the Psychic Readers Network, Stephen Fetter and his cousin Peter Stotts of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, of consumer violations. Scamming your clients out of millions posed no threat to either Stephen or Peter's freedom because they'd avoid jail time altogether. Stephen was allowed to walk free, whereas Peter was sentenced to two years probation. The network tallied in over a billion dollars worth of revenue since its beginning, which would be split evenly after the FTC demanded they'd forgive $500 million in consumer charges and pay an additional fine of $5 million. The verdict left the owners in a financial limbo, resulting in the sale of their Fort Lauderdale waterfront mansion. Uray Dale Harris, on the other hand, was found not guilty and dropped from all charges. Forfeiting $500 million would surely put a dent in anyone's pockets. However, compared to the profit earned or a uh, scammed, all three, Stephen Fetter, Peter Stotts, and Miss Cleo, practically left the trial unscathed. Though she was found innocent of any wrongdoings, that didn't stop the public from deeming her the fraudulent psychic who scammed vulnerable souls out of millions. Feeling the wrath of the backlash, she hid away in the safety of her Florida home and hung up her turban as Miss Cleo for good. Cleo, on the other hand, was still out here doing what she did best, hustling. She went under the radar for a little while before popping back up in 2005, voicing the eerie voodoo fool Haitian matriarch Auntie Pole in the video game Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Cleo was back like she never left, this time popping up in ads for Uncle Mel's used cars in Plantation, Florida, as well as coming out to Advocate Magazine the following year. Operations under the Psychic Readers Network ceased all production. However, she never put down the tarot deck. Only this time, she'd refrain from directly predicting people's futures because surprisingly to literally no one, she wasn't an actual psychic. But according to Cleo, Yure, Cleo Millie, or Ray herself, she tried to tell y'all. I come from a family of spooky people. I come from a family of Obeya, which is another word for voodoo. My teacher was Haitian, a mambo born in Port-au-Prince. And I studied under her for some 30 years and then became a mambo myself. So they refer to me as psychic because the word voodoo scares just about everybody. So they told me, no, 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 we can't use that word. We're going to call you a psychic. I said, but I'm not a psychic. For the most part, let Cleo tell it, those predictions she made on those infomercials were real, for the most part. Referring to herself as a shaman, someone having access or influence in the spirit world, or an elder in a community who has visions and gives direction to people in their village, or rather a voodoo priestess. No, she wasn't born in Jamaica. Yes, she admits to being able to speak perfect English. Nevertheless, she insists she has ties to the island and speaks in Patois, a practice she suppressed during her earlier years due to her parents convincing her that she'd be treated much better without it. Let her lawyers tell it, she's as Jamaican as anyone with ties to that country can be. Those over at the Psychic Readers Network never did bounce back from their court case, shifting to online operations in 2012, this time under new management. Taking a whack at spoken poetry, she released two CDs, Convicted for My Beliefs and Full Moon Madness. 
2015 would be the last time we'd see Miss Cleo appear in the spotlight, appearing in an April Fool's Day ad for Benefit Cosmetics. Just one year later, on July 16th, Ure Dale Harris was pronounced dead at a hospital in Palm Beach County, Florida due to metastatic colon cancer. She was only 53. Such mystery surrounds Ure Harris till this day. We know so much yet so little about the self-proclaimed voodoo priestess. Even with the knowledge we do know, many still question her authenticity. Does she really know how to speak patois? According to those that do, ain't no way. Does she actually have ties to the Caribbean? Was she actually adopted? Truth is, the world may never know. Although her list of unsealed identities gives insight to what she could have been, perhaps Miss Cleo's first introduction wasn't on a Langston Hughes stage, rather a go-to childhood ally during Uray's most desperate times in need. Trauma affects everyone differently, and disassociating oneself in the midst of intense emotional wounding isn't as uncommon as you think. Combined with a potential lack of self-worth, one is taught early on that their authentic selves isn't worth knowing, resulting in suppressing parts of thyself in order to survive. Whichever part enabled Ure to live in her childhood household became a part of who the world got to know as Cleo. Or maybe we're entirely off and she created a timeless persona that stuck. Either way, whether you believe it or not, Miss Cleo remains stored in the pop culture realm for eternity. Call her a disputed icon. What are your thoughts on Miss Cleo? Let us know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments and stay tuned for more true celebrity stories.